The name Trafalgar has become synonymous with Great Britain. For over 200 years, the story has been told and the battle commemorated. Yet the name itself is of Arabic origin and dates back to the Moorish occupation of Spain. It was here that Destiny chose to act out the greatest sea battle from the age of sail. Two fleets, one British and the other a combined fleet of French and Spanish warships, would become a part of legend. The Spanish Admiral Gravina and the French Admiral Villeneuve had an extremely strained relationship and the French were not made at all welcome in the port. Captain Jean Luca of the French ship Redoutable described what happened. On the 20th of October, the combined fleet got under sail to leave Cadiz. The fleet comprised 33 sail of the line, of which 18 were French, 15 Spanish. Midshipman William Stanhope Badcock of the British ship Neptune was anticipating the battle to come. All hearts towards the evening beat with joyful anxiety for the next day, which we hoped would crown our anxious blockade labours with successful battle. During the time before the enemy fleet put to sea, Nelson had spent many hours in conference with his various captains. This was Nelson's style at work again. He consulted, discussed and formulated his plan of attack in concert with his fellow officers. His band of brothers. Initially, Nelson wanted to form three lines of ships to attack the enemy at a right angle, anticipating that the combined fleet would form one continual line. This approach would break the line in three places and what he described as a pell-mell battle would follow with each British ship able to engage in one-on-one -on -one combat. As it turned out, there were not enough British ships available to Nelson to form three separate lines and so he refined the plan to two with his old friend Admiral Collingwood leading one and himself the other. As the British fleet approached the French and Spanish in its two divisions, Nelson spoke to his signal lieutenant John Pascoe. His lordship came to me on the poop. He said, Mr. Pascoe, I wish to say to the fleet, England confides that every man will do his duty, and added, you must be quick, for I have one more signal to make, which is for close action. Lieutenant Pascoe explained that the word confides would have to be spelt out and suggested replacing it with the word expects, as it would require only one flag for the whole word. Nelson agreed, and the signal flags were hoisted. At a slow walking pace, the fleets moved closer together, with Admiral Collingwood's leeward division pushing ahead of Nelson's. At approximately 12 noon, ranging shots from the French and Spanish ships were splashing around the Royal Sovereign. Nelson remarked, see how that noble fellow Collingwood takes his ship into action. And at presumably the same time, Captain Rotherham, Collingwood's flag captain, remarked, what would Nelson give to be here? The battle had begun. Admiral Collingwood's division broke the line and the Royal Sovereign fired its first broadside into the Spanish ship Santa Ana at approximately 20 past 12. A little later, it was Nelson's turn to join the fight. The victory approached the enemy at the head of the weather, the upwind column, and broke the line firing into Admiral Villeneuve's flagship, the Beaucentour. As Nelson's ship moved past the Beaucentour, it became entangled with the French ship Redoutable, and a fierce battle between the two began, both seeking the upper hand, both aiming to cripple and board the other. Captain Luca had trained his men hard while at Cadiz, and had positioned marksmen in the fighting tops of his ship in order to cause maximum disruption to the enemy. As Captain Hardy turned and walked on, he noticed that Nelson was no longer by his side. Turning around, he saw the Admiral lying on the deck. It was about 1.15. A musket ball fired from the Redu Tarble had struck Nelson on the left shoulder, torn through his gold epaulette and penetrated his chest, lodging in his lower back. The most authoritative account of Nelson's injury and his last moments was relayed by the victory surgeon, Dr. William Beatty. He reported that Nelson, after Hardy had said that he hoped that he was not severely wounded, replied, They have done for me at last, Hardy. My backbone is shot through. The Admiral was then carried below to the sick bay on the Orlop deck of the Victory. He insisted on waiting his turn for treatment with the other men, according to the first-come, first-served tradition of the Navy. Dr. Beatty continued, His Lordship was laid upon a bed, stripped of his clothes and covered with a sheet. He said, I am gone. I have to leave Lady Hamilton and my adopted daughter Horatia as a legacy to my country. Nelson knew that he was dying. Aside from making his passing as comfortable as possible, there was nothing that 19th century medicine could do for him. The thunderous noise of cannon fire, the screams of the wounded and dying mixed with the shouting of orders and fighting men must have been an assault on the senses hard to imagine over 200 years later. 
The pell-mell battle that Nelson desired had come to pass, and the orderly lines of French, Spanish and British battleships had melted into individual ship actions as the fleets slogged it out for supremacy. Captain of Marines James Atchley described the scene that greeted him and his men after they boarded the Beau Centaur. The dead, thrown back as they fell, lay along the middle of the decks in heaps, and the shot passing through these had frightfully mangled the bodies. More than 400 had been killed or wounded, of whom an extraordinary proportion had lost their heads. During the hours of battle, Nelson clung on to life. He repeatedly asked for Captain Hardy, who'd been forced to withdraw back to the deck as his duty demanded. When Hardy eventually returned, they shook hands, and Nelson asked how the day was going. Very well, my lord, Hardy replied. We have got 12 or 14 of the enemy ships in our possession. I hope, said Nelson, that none of our ships have struck. No, my lord, there is no fear of that. Throughout Nelson's suffering, he repeatedly remarked, Thank God I have done my duty. Eventually, the opportunity presented itself for Hardy to return and to congratulate the Admiral on a great victory. Saying that he couldn't be certain, but that he was sure that 14 or 15 ships had surrendered, Nelson replied, That is well, but I had bargained for 20. Dr. Beatty's account continued, describing perhaps the most touching episode of Nelson's last moments. He then told Captain Hardy he felt that in a few minutes he should be no more, adding in a low tone, Don't throw me overboard. The captain answered, Oh no, certainly not. Then replied his lordship, You know what to do. Take care of my dear Lady Hamilton. Kiss me, Hardy. The captain now knelt down and kissed his cheek. When his lordship said, Now I am satisfied. Thank God I have done my duty. Captain Hardy stood for a minute or two in silent contemplation. He then knelt down again and kissed his lordship's forehead. God bless you, Hardy. This touching moment of human interaction reveals much about Nelson. At the time of his death, he thanked God, showed concern for the woman and child he loved, and sought a last demonstration of human contact. Perhaps this last act of Hardy's enabled Nelson to depart, knowing that he was loved, respected, and not alone. Aboard the Royal Sovereign, Admiral Collingwood had already been informed of Nelson's injury. Writing later to a friend, he said, An officer came from the victory to tell me he was wounded. He sent his love to me and desired me to conduct the fleet. I asked the officer if the wound was dangerous, and he, by his look, told me what he could not speak, nor I reflect upon now without suffering again the anguish of that moment. For the loss of no British ships, 17 French and Spanish vessels were taken as prizes. However, the victory was far from secure. As Nelson had anticipated, a storm was brewing, and each man, whether friend or foe, seaman or admiral, had to now battle the elements for survival. Once the storm had abated, the battered British fleet under the command of Admiral Collingwood limped into Gibraltar. Nelson's body had been preserved in a large barrel of French brandy, and was guarded day and night as the victory, after emergency repairs, slowly made its way from Gibraltar back home to England. There was a suggestion that another, more able and less damaged ship should carry Nelson home. The sailors aboard Victory would have none of it. And so the honour fell to the flagship and her crew to return the fallen hero back to the nation of his birth. The news of the great victory at Trafalgar and of Nelson's loss had reached London in the early hours of November the 6th. On hearing the news, the King was rendered speechless. The population was grief-stricken. Even the news of the greatest naval victory ever couldn't compensate for the loss of Nelson.